Hey everyone, so I recently brought out a few films about David Icke and London Real, and there's so many different topics that they raise. Censorship, free speech, uh, the growth in conspiracy theories, uh, the recent pandemic film blew up a few days ago, and that's even, even bigger than the, the David Icke interview. So I felt kind of overwhelmed with all of those different threads to follow, and I thought the best thing to do would be to talk it through with my friend Peter Lindbergh, who he's done a lot on this topic with his Intellectual Explorers podcast, and also recently we put out the film Culture War 2.0 with him on Rebel Wisdom. So we look at all of these different topics, and especially kind of try and dig into what is good journalism, good sense making in this environment, this kind of liminal space that we're all in, which Peter has called the liminal war. Just just for the topology of the conversation, what what are your what are your thoughts? I guess uh, my first question would be, um, what are you hoping to get from a conversation like this? Yeah. I put out those three films last week and there's so many different angles to them. There's so many different kind of questions about sense making in the liminal space that we're in. There's the massive topic of conspiracy theories that is kind of exploding right now. There's this sense of kind of the reaction of like the big tech platforms. There's the relationship between conspiracy and sense making and it's all the things we've been talking about on the channel for a very long time like how we use um, discernment in this kind of digitalized age to make sense of things rather than relying on truth and the sort of the broadcast mainstream uh, blue church apparatus to make sense of things and all of these different ways of making sense kind of in, co in competition and clashing with each other. Like, I don't know what the answers are. I don't know what the solution is. I don't think anyone knows what the solution to finding truth in the new decentralized environment is. I've talked about this kind of interregnum period where we've lost the sense-making blue church apparatus. And we were basically, um, whether we realized it or not, we were offloading a lot of our sense-making capacity to that structure. So Blue Church being the establishment that was constructed after 1945 that includes hierarchical authority, it's a generally broadcast model, it obviously includes all of the, um, the main media organisations and now we're having to reboot from, from scratch but we're doing it in a really kind of haphazard way and, and really like Rebel Wisdom has been about at least from the, the middle of last year, rather than the content itself. It's like, what's the process that we come to making sense of the world? And how can we improve that? How can we improve our discernment? How can we, how can we catch ourselves uh, lo locking into like certainty and certain exp and explanations? How can we rest in uncertainty and weigh things up? And this area of conspiracy theory more than any other seems to have that quality of like, this is the truth. And then, right. and then a real attachment in a sort of pseudo-religious way. And I also feel it really difficult to talk about it because there's so many different things. Like the word conspiracy is such an overloaded term. There's like alternative narratives of which some of them have more truth than others. Um, and it's used as a way of kind of dismissing anything that, that it sort of deviates from a mainstream narrative. But then you've got another factor in there as well which is where I feel like there's a qualitative difference between alternative narratives of things that have happened like the Kennedy assassination particular events and then this kind of all-consuming explanation for everything which a friend of mine was talking about recently and he said and I it feels like a qualitative difference to me, like those two things, and one can slip into the other very quickly and very easily. But why I wanted to come into this conversation with you is that I know you, you, you've run the Intellectual Explorers Club, you've, you've dealt with these topics a lot, you've probably gone more deeply into it than I have. And I have a, a sense that the, the right way to proceed is in this inquiry rather than a kind of, this is what I think modality. One of the criticisms of the piece that I thought was, was right, uh, the Brian Rose piece, was look, Fuller is just trying to set himself up as the, as the judge and jury 
And it's like, yeah, that's not, that's obviously not, a, that's not gonna work. Like, even though, even when I'm doing that kind of talking to camera, it's not a definitive statement, but there is something about the nature of, the nature of YouTube, the nature of, of, of broadcast at all, feels like, it feels like a definitive statement. And as soon as you make a definitive statement, you open yourself up to be criticized. And that's fine, that's the process, and that's a process of coming to truth, but it also feels off in some way. I think we have to find a new way of, of sense-making in this, particularly in this liminal space. What we need is some kind of, some kind of rules of engagement or some kind of, um, some kind of, I don't know, decentralized method of like, um, I don't know, maybe like a, yeah, like a code of conduct or like a set of principles or something that, that more people can sign up to. If, if I have any, 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 any kind of certainty, it's that certainty is wrong. Hmm. Like anyone who, who has any kind of certainty about what is going on right now and who's behind it and what's really, like that feels like an all-encompassing explanation, I'm immediately suspicious of because you just get into this, like, how do they know that? If you actually listen carefully and with discernment when lots of people are speaking and lots of people who are getting massively kind of upregulated right now and you listen with discernment, you think, how do they know that? Okay, they may have expertise in this particular area, but they're asserting things about Bill Gates, Fauci, like these vast conspiracies. It's like, they don't know. They have no greater insight into that than anyone else. So that, that, was, that was delicious everything you said um and there's like so many threads that are coming to mind right now that we can go down uh i first wanted to say uh two things um that came to mind when i watched your your latest three videos or rebel wisdom's latest three videos is that one that when you're talking to that camera that that one where you're talking to the camera was like the first one you did that i got fired up seeing that like there's like i got thumos like came to my body that's when i reached out to you because i've been like away from the rebel wisdom family for like the last two months because of my own project um, but I got inspired to get plugged back in after seeing that. And then that's why when I reached out to you yesterday, that's why we're here. Uh, we just spontaneously like, uh, said, let's do this. Let's have this conversation. So that's one thing I just wanted to mention. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that, uh, how I appreciated your approach because it was like hyper nuanced and there's no easy answer that you presented. Like, you know, the big tech companies like Brian, Brian Rose and on the, like the, uh, the tension that you have because you like him on one extent, but then you, you see his, his personal faults. Um, and I actually felt your tension there. I felt the nuance when you were talking about it and it felt authentic to me. Um, so I just wanted to appreciate that. And I think we need more of that. Um, so that being said, I, I have, I have a desire to like kind of just go down the, the, the confusion, your confusion, the unknowingness there, just get the color and taste of it. But maybe the, uh, a more prudent question is why, like, let's maybe go down a little bit more though, why the conspiracy theory stuff captured your attention initially. Um, and, and you already touched on it. Uh, but as you know, there's a lot of battlefronts in the culture war, what, what I'm kind of dubbing the liminal war now. And there's something there about like the potency of certainty that the conspiracy theory narrative has. Um, so maybe you can kind of speak a little bit more on that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the simple answer is that they are, like I'm a journalist, and they are, as far as I can tell, the most newsworthy phenomenon right now. Like, if you, if you know anything about the way we make sense of the world, you realize that, especially right now, where we have an almost infinite amount of information, you can kind of make mo pretty much any narrative that you want. And you follow these rabbit holes down and you kind of are either persuaded by something or not persuaded by something. So just as a phenomenon, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And then it also plays into all of these wider topics of how we make sense of the world at all. Why we think something is true rather than something else being true. Uh, the psychological basis for, so for a lot of this stuff. And then why I feel it's so difficult to talk about is one, that there's so much charge around it. Like people are really charged up about these topics and there's a kind of religious dimension to them. Like there is a religious dimension to it uh, on some level. 
And that isn't to say, again, that isn't to make any judgment about the truth claims. And so you, you get, so my uncertainty is tied to this feeling of it's very difficult to talk about with nuance. Because if you, if you, you can fall on one side of sounding like you're saying uh, you just need to sort of trust the mainstream narratives and any alternative explanations are bullshit, or on the other side of uh, giving too much credence to stuff that is kind of has seems to have very little basis in in reality. So you've got that kind of knife edge thing. So I think the the right place to sort of the right place to hold is like how are we making sense? What is our how is our discernment being challenged? Where are we collapsing into certainty and fixed narratives rather than holding a balance of probabilities? A lot of things that sort of frame themselves as searching for truth, and I'd, I'd say like the pandemic film is the most obvious example of that recently, is sort of framed as revealing the truth, is also like highly manipulative, highly partial, highly, is this weird sort of dynamic of we're going to help you find the truth and it's our truth, it's this truth. Like that, that feels like a very complex thing to, to unpack. Like it doesn't feel, the whole thing on all sides feels like it's taking people's agency and people's discernment away because it's, and it's part of the, as we've talked about a lot on the channel, this sort of sense of game A dynamics Game A being the current system that we have, the underlying source code that we have, game B being any potential other system, being accelerated with exponential tech, and especially in, in the field of sense making, what we're seeing is like the most sticky, the most powerful mimetic um, artifacts being accelerated increasingly fast. It feels like the pandemic is a... Um, is a catalyst for all of the worst things about the game A society. Weaponized attention, selecting for the most powerful, most sticky, most compelling certain narratives and nuance and discernment is really under threat. While at the same time, you've got this kind of mainstream perspective, which actually to me doesn't really feel like the mainstream anymore. It feels like it's just one thing among many. And that mainstream perspective is being challenged hugely because lots of things that from the beginning of the, the crisis have been sort of like, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. The idea it could have come from a, from a lab is a conspiracy theory. Right now, there's really, for me, quite compelling circumstantial evidence, at least, that it did like, it, it seems to me at least as probable that it came from a lab as it came from a wild origin. And that's, what, that's one example, but you've got this kind of, like, sense of the mainstream. Like, that, when people say, well, the mainstream feels like a conspiracy theory right now, that it's true. The mainstream does feel a lot like a cons Like, if you're just accept... Like, the blue church is really buckling under the strain of novelty and under the strain of the, this sort of sense-making overload that is going on under the, under the uh, impact of the virus. So it's like all, it's an it's a incredibly difficult to hold picture. And I think as I kind of tried to unpack in the, in the first film, I think our way, our certainties of, of making sense just aren't up to it. Um, free speech absolutism in an environment where attention is finite and distraction is infinite while the consequences of misinformation and the consequences of getting things wrong now take on a sort of life or death quality. While also the necessity of challenging some of those narratives as well is also important. And then you've got this kind of simplistic collapse of, for example, YouTube saying, we will only accept stuff now that goes along with the WHO guidelines. And it's like, have you, have you not seen like what the WHO has been doing, like how in hock to China they've been saying that you shouldn't wear masks. I mean, the WHO has, has said some pretty crazy things. Yeah, when you were talking, the, the word dangerous comes to mind. And actually, like, fear kind of just went through my body a little bit talking about this, knowing that this potentially could be broadcast on the Rebel Wisdom channel. It's like, oh, how is this going to be interpreted? And I like that kind of distinction where there's, like, 
you know, the conspiratorial aspects of the blue church and then the, the whole kind of, kind of conspiracy narrative, QAnon, all that stuff is coming online. And how do you talk with nuance there um, without pissing either of them off? Like for me, uh, with the, the stuff I used to do with the, the culture war analysis, it's like I really like to take the principle of charity, right? And where I pass the ideological Turing test in such a way where I can uh, map out uh, the propositions of a mimetic tribe or a person in such a way that they feel completely understood. And then, so you just, you just be a method actor with their ideology, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and also to kind of to sink in, what do they feel like on a felt sense level when they believe to be true, what they believe to be true. Right. And if you can do both of those things, you can really talk to someone. Um, most people don't do that. Uh, so I, I like uh, having the Omega rule and all that type of stuff with the medic tribe. But if you do that, you're going to get trouble with the blue church. If you do that with the conspiracy theory stuff, because then you're just one of them. Right. And so that's not good. You get canceled. The big tech companies could uh, ban you on YouTube, all that type of stuff. Alternatively, criticism is important. You know, this is being a performative agnostic is not a panacea. You got to actually challenge people's truth claims because people are wrong. And if you do that with the people with the conspiratorial, because there's, there is signal, in, in, in the noise, but there's a lot of noise. But if you challenge it with this sort of like religious intensity, you're one of the bad guys. You're one of the shills, you know, then they're going to come after you. So it's like, like, you know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't hear. And it feels like a very, very dangerous game to play, um, especially when you're sense making in a broadcast sort of way, which Rebel Wisdom is doing. Um, so I feel uh, what you're feeling right now or potentially feeling, or I, I think I feel what you're potentially feeling. Yeah, I mean, it feels like I try to personally put out stuff that I feel that I can defend, that I can agree with, um, and I can stand behind. But what I feel like my particular perspective on this is, is um, like how do, you, how do you retain the best of the values of the, the existing structure, which at its best was was functional like journalism at its best where it's really aiming at truth and is looking to get both sides of the story and is offering people the right of reply so you're not putting out stuff without putting it to them first which i tried to model in the in the it was more of a sort of show don't tell like i can i can tell people like this is how you're supposed to do these things but i think it's far more valuable to demonstrate what good truth seeking looks like um there was, a, there was a functioning system that became corrupt. It became corrupt, it became hollowed out, like increasingly hollowed out. But when it worked, and probably the last time it worked properly in America, I'd say it's probably like the 1970s, you had, like journalism had a really important function of holding power to account. And it, it was a, you had a small number of media channels. So if you were asked to go on that media channel, you would have to go on it and if you didn't go on it and you as a, news pe as a news person would say, we asked the government if someone was available and they said no one was available. That would, that would sting. That would kind of be empty chairing someone. We're now in this kind of almost infinite media environment where there's no real consequences for people to go on some and not go on others. It's accelerated the point where people are not asking difficult questions because they're worried that that person isn't going to come back on their channel. And that's the, that's the same... So that's a failure condition of the alternative media, but it's also a failure of the mainstream media now because there are so many more outlets for, for everyone. It's very hard even um, when you don't have any sort of established truth-seeking environment, it's very hard then to hold people to account who need to be held to account because I think good truth-seeking, again, slipping into kind of the jargon that we're familiar with, I think journalism and academia practiced in the way they are meant to be practiced is actually a game B enterprise. Like it is, it's a truth-seeking enterprise. It's, and game A is all of the forces that have captured that truth-seeking enterprise. I think Brett and Eric talked about it on the Rubin Report really well as that truth-seeking cannot survive an encounter with market forces. But that's why I think the, a lot of the conspiracy theories the instinct is right. It's kind of like Brett again talks about religion being metaphorically true and fat and literally false. I, I don't fully buy that. I think 
Like a lot of Christians are very upset about that definition, but I think there's some truth in that. And I think there's some truth in, for me, a lot of the more extravagant conspiracy theories are metaphorically true and literally false. And I think they're metaphorically true because we are in a completely dysfunctional system that has rotted from the inside out for all of these systemic reasons. I think I've heard people use the the, the think of Baudrillard to explain it as kind of his idea of simulation, that any structure becomes a becomes hollowed out once you establish it as a structure. If it was a truth-seeking structure, what you end, what ends up happening is that you get people who are maneuvering within that structure for other reasons other, rather than truth. And it becomes increasingly hollowed out. And I think that, especially in America, is what we're seeing. And I think a lot of people are perceiving that a lot of these structures have essentially become hollowed out. That's the civilizational threat that I think a lot of people are picking up. And I think a lot of them are sort of mis, misdiagnosing it. So you and I spoke often about like playing chess with cancel culture. Mm. Um, and like cancel culture is usually associated with the social justice activists or the social justice warriors or the woke purity. Um, and it's interesting. I think they used to have a lot of momentum in, in culture war 2.0 before for COVID. Now the kind of the conspiracy theory stuff, I think that is the mimetic tribe that has the momentum now. Um, and I would also argue that every single mimetic tribe, especially like I would say most mimetic tribes are disembodied tribes um, in the deepest sense. I think they all have their version of cancel culture. So it's like what I was mentioning before, it's like that the blue church tribe, uh, you know, they have their cancel culture. So if you don't like signal hard against these conspiracy theory stuff, then you're going to get canceled by them. The, the conspiracy theory stuff, if you even criticize them one inch, you know, you're going to get canceled by them. So there's the cancel culture threat exists uh, across the board with all mimetic tribes. So, and that's a kind of a skill set to have, like <laughs> playing chess with cancel culture. And I think we're, you know, you and I, mm. out of anyone, we're pretty good at it. Uh, so far, <laughs> it's yeah. not, not knock on wood. What I see when I read um, a lot of mainstream treatments of uh, conspiracy theories is this kind of necessity of virtue signaling to the audience to say, like every other line is, this conspiracy theory, that has no basis in fact. Like, and you ha I, I know that feeling. I know if I was to write something for one of the mainstream mainstream organs, if I didn't put that in, it would be put in by the editor. Like they have to constantly signal to everyone else in that network, like it's a kind of virtue signaling to say, we know this is not true. Oh, and by the way, we need to reinforce that there is no link between 5G and Corona and just make that absolutely clear. But there, there, with that kind of the old school journalism, there's like a felt sense level of like knowing this, even if they're right. And even if they're earnest for the truth, there's this felt sense of knowingness. And it's just, it kind of annoys me <laughs> where I think in order to be this was new world, uh, especially in this sort of in-between space that we're in, we got to return to Socrates. You know, the only thing I know is I know nothing and really build an intimate relationship with unknowingness. And I think if people don't have an intimate relationship with unknowingness, with unknowingness, with uncertainty, unknowingness, they're going to run into narratives that provide that certainty. So that's another question that's coming up for me right now is how do you earnestly sense make as a good journalist in this liminal war when you're, you're trying to be accessible to people who don't have a good relationship with unknowingness? Like I'm, I'm a practicing stoic, as you know, and then I like, I like Jordan Hall's kind of, uh, uh, I'm repurposing Jordan Hall's kind of phrase and putting it as the axiomatic, uh, goal of stoicism, if you will, is being in right relationship with reality. And if you're in, if you're going to be in right relationship with reality, you got to be in right relationship with everything in reality, including emotional states and realities of uncertainty of unknowingness. And I think if you don't have, if you're not in right relationship with that state, if you're not comfortable with swimming in that state, uh, when you need to swim in it, then you're going to run into these unhealthy and pathological, uh, forms of knowingness. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the, if we can tease out a question there is how do you sense make in a broadcast medium when the people that are going to consume your artifacts don't have a good relationship with uncertainty or unknowingness? 
Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is we're all going to have to develop that. Like the, I think it was Jamie Wheel who used the Buckminster Fuller quote at the beginning of one of his lectures. Our task is primarily metaphysical. It is to spontaneously develop the behaviors that will avoid extinction. And I think that is one of the primary ones is developing that relationship with, with uncertainty. And also that it's a, it's a, um, it's an existential project for sure. Like it's an existential project to develop that in ourselves and to, to, because I, because I, I think if we don't, I mean, I, I, I go as far as to say, I know that if we don't, that this trajectory we're on right now is going to be self-extinguishing because, because we are so easily weaponized on one side or the other of, of different questions. And then we're like that sort of polarization and tribalization around these fixed identities. The only way out of it is to be able to, to pull up to another level where you can see complementary truths and understand that they both hold essential values, like the right and the left, which I think we both agree is kind of a, not a particularly helpful framework for understanding the world right now, like the value of self-responsibility and of um, loyalty, accountability, self-empowerment that the right holds has to be balanced with care, empathy that, that the left holds. And actually that the right has a different form of care and empathy that looks different from the left. Um, so all of these, uh, but it, but it, yeah, but it's more of a kind of individualist. Like that, there, there is no, we have to come out of these either or situations. There is a concern about kind of this, these conversations being too exclusive because of the terminology that's being used. I, I was wondering, it would actually be quite good to put together a glossary of terms for the sort of broader, maybe a, either rebel wisdom glossary of terms or a, a, you've got good coinage game. Like we've, we've, we've kind of, we've given you props in the past for having good coinage game. And I think you even came up with coinage game as well as one. So uh, you even got good coinage game at creating coinage game. Um, like you come up with some very good sticky heuristics like your Culture War 2.0 piece, I think, was really, really useful for that. Like the liminal war, um, grey pills, and mimetic mediation in particular. The idea that what's required is some kind of mediation between these different mimetic tribes who've coalesced around different perspectives. Um, all of that is super important and super useful. And I think, yeah, if anyone's watching this and wants to help on putting a glossary together, then I think that could be a good artifact to put out there for people to, um, to, to dive into. Um, we haven't come up with a good, like this thing, whatever it is, this, this space that I'm in, that you're in, and various other people are in, it is a thing, but none of us have come up with a particularly useful uh, word for it. Game B is one, sense-making web is another. Um, probably the sense-making web, I think, is my favorite of, so. of all of the... Yeah, I like, I like the sense making web as well. And there's like all these adjacent sort of like this game B, the meta modernist, the post rationalist, but the kind of the sense making web kind of uh, it's like an umbrella term for for all of them in a way. That's that's the way I, I view it. Uh, every every Sunday uh, at the store we have a mediation campfire with Jason Snyder and Jared James. They have the both end podcast, and it's basically a mimetic mediation podcast. And so the three of us we just gather around the digital campfire and it's just talk about mimetic mediation with a bunch of people. Um, and last session was pretty good. Like, uh, put me at the edge of my thinking there, thinking about mimetic medi mediation. What, what is the goal of it really? Um, because there's this sort of, uh, the instinctual pushback from a lot of mimetic tribes is the, the both sidesism argument or the all sidesism argument. Like, what are you saying? Everyone is just equal. You got to find the middle ground between the two. And I'm like, no, right. Like, no. So for example, like one of our friends, uh, uh, Jessica, um, she's like a really good faith feminist. You put Jessica in a conversation with some kind of like a uh, woman hating incel, um, let's say they actually have a conversation propositionally and even like, like emotionally, I'm, I'm on Jessica's side, hands down, right? So it's not gonna be somewhere in between, in my opinion, if they, they have a conversation. 
But if the goal of mimetic mediation is to get into right relationship with each meme, with each tribe, then maybe, you know, Jessica will move down, you know, a, uh, you know, a little bit, the, the incel will move up a lot, and then maybe they'll find themselves in the right relationship. But if you can somehow figure them, figure out how to get them to the table, then that is like, you know, you almost won in a way. If you can actually get them to the table and sit down and allow them to get in that state of unknowingness together. Mm. Um, and so why I brought that up is that we we're talking about like what makes a good mimetic mediator and trust, you know, it's like the capacity uh, to not just appear, but to be trustworthy mm. and to model a certain behavior. And that's what I like, why, why like just to circle back to the appreciation I had for your nuance is that that engendered trust. Uh, like when I saw you, I, I started trusting you. I already trusted you, but like, you know, like I, if I didn't know you, I, I would have felt, I had a felt sense of trust there. And so what's coming up right now is maybe the way in order to approach this existential project is to model uh, being trustworthy in this liminal state. And if that's the case, how to do that. Yeah. It's like Daniel uh, Schmachtenberger talked about in the, in the war on sense making piece, doing sense making, like the, the solution for the problem of truth and the problem of sense making requires a huge amount of intimacy. It requires a huge amount of like honesty and wrestling in public. And another thing that a few people have said is like, show me the people who are wrestling with things in public. Don't, I don't want to see people who are certain about anything right now. I want to see people who are clearly going through the process of wrestling with difficult polarities that cannot be reconciled. And also the, the intimacy thing is putting stuff out there that is vulnerable as well, is like talking about your own inner process of what's going on when you're coming to these conclusions or not con conclusions and saying, yeah, I feel uncertain, I feel... And also, if you fuck things up, say, look, I fucked that up. Um, like, I don't... For example, just taking, a, taking a, an example now, it's like Brian Rose, I don't see a way back for him unless he's prepared to say, actually, I fucked up, the, the, the worst angels of my nature got, got me, and, and I, I, I did some things that um, I wasn't completely honest about this, I wasn't completely honest about that, um, but I did it because I'm passionate about this thing, and I believe, or whatever, whether, whatever, we don't want to speculate about his real motivations, but it, it fascinates me how the sort of stuff that you and I and, and, and Rebel Wisdom and many of the other people that we know in this space like we've, most of us have got some kind of a grounding in some kind of inner work around interpersonal dealings, whether that's circling or whether that's uh, authentic relating or all of these different things. It's like, and that requires immense emotional honesty and emotional intimacy to actually have those conversations. And I think what we're reaching towards is some kind of way of doing what we've done in those interpersonal contexts in a public forum around some of these bigger, like cultural topics. So this is really good. And we uh, don't know how to do it yet. So I'll, I'll share, I'll, I'll be intimate and share like a personal story. Uh, and I think I shared it with you before, but I'll share it with, with uh, this audience is that um, before COVID, uh, COVID happened, I, I received some like bad news personally. Um, I, won't, I won't share it now, but I, I already shared it with you. And, um, so about two months ago now, and I was devastated, right? I was just like laying on the sofa, having like an existential crisis. And the thought that came online is like, what do I do now with my life? I had no idea what to do with my life. And there was judgment around that. It's like I, I re read so much books that all these spiritual practices, all these goal setting methodologies, and I don't know how to live my life right now. And there was shame there. Um, and then the adjacent thought emerged like, hey, no one else knows how to live my life either. And then that kind of like allowed me to see the shame and it sort of like just disappeared. And then being a good stoic and wanting to be in right relationship with reality, I'm like, okay, how do I be in right relationship of not knowing how to live my life? 
And this is sort of like starting to build an intimacy with unknowingness. And I started my journals on the, the letter pro platform where I'm just being radically honest. Um, and what's coming up there is, uh, and maybe this is a clip, I think John and I mentioned it in our conversation we had in Toronto, so maybe you can play this clip as well. Uh, in one of our circling sessions, because John and I uh, and Lubomir and a few other people, Lubomir was on the channel as well, we were having a bi-weekly circling group, authentic relating practice group in Toronto. And then John had this like really profound insight. Uh, he said that in order to be someone's peer, you not only have to have the capacity to peer through them, but you have to allow them to peer through you. And th that's sort of like what we're talking about, about just sort of like modeling this, this, this behavior. And I think this is exactly what we're doing right now with you and me, kind of just putting ourselves at the, the edge of our thinking here publicly, uh, being a little messy, not knowing where we're going to go, what's going to emerge. Um, but people see this and they're like, okay, I imagine people see this like, okay, these people aren't that bad, right? They're not like bad faith actors. And, and the, the, another thing that came up was that, that I like the word of the intimacy. And also, let's not be shy about being a little seductive, right? Because really, I feel like I'm up for grabs right now. I feel like narratives could seduce me. And I'm open to that reality and possibility, especially if they're truthful ones. And so being up for grabs while you're this radically honest and truthful unknown state is kind of seductive. Certainly our honesty and authenticity resonates with people. That for me was one of the failure conditions of this, um, like the IDW project was, uh, uh, that I didn't get a sense of that authenticity or that kind of sense of people really wrestling. Um, it's really hard to show vulnerability when you have people who either do or you suspect might weaponize and use that against you. Like it's a really, it's, a, it's kind of an easy thing to do um, when you don't have a huge profile. It's a lot harder to do when you do have a huge profile. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me and attracted a lot of people, I think, to Jordan Peterson originally was this sense that you did see him wrestling in real time with things. Like you, you got, he was the, in a way, I think that was why he was such a perfect intellectual for the digital age is that you saw, you felt an intimacy with him and you felt him wrestling with what was going on with him. And I remember once I saw him kind of musing on, on, one of his Q and A's about how he was feeling a lot more defensive and a lot more reactive around some of the press interviews that he was getting. And he talked about it as a, as a corruption of his soul. And I was like, that's, that's really, that's the kind of honesty and the kind of personal willingness to share his own personal process that I think was why he was so successful and why a lot of people felt this real connection to him. And I don't think I've seen that I can't think of many other people who've done that. I might be wrong. There may be others. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I agree. I think Peterson's a different beast in that way. Um, and, you know, so like, you know, and I mentioned this on um, my journals now and, and the STOA, but I haven't mentioned this publicly at like Rebel Wisdom, but he was my therapist for two years um, before he became famous. And, um, you know, so I have a great love for him. Uh, he, he helped me out. But I will, um, I guess I will criticize him here if, if you want to call this criticism. I do agree with you that he has this sort of like radical form of truthfulness. Um, like the Kathy Newman interview just displayed that with brilliance and you did a documentary about that. Um, and people haven't seen that before. Like what's going on here? And then the, the Blue Church, he has like agents and stuff right now. So I call them like is it the epistemic bouncers that he, he, he has from the Blue Church. I imagine they have a hard time containing a guy like Peterson. Um, fully because uh, he's so committed to his truthfulness muscle but when i have a sense and i could be wrong here and it could be uncharitable but he doesn't always come from a place of love especially when he's criticizing the social justice activist or whether i don't feel he's coming from a place of love mm -hmm. in those moments and i think in order to be intimate and possibly seductive because uh, there's nothing wrong with being seductive especially if it comes about organically is being truthful in this state of unknowingness with love. Mm -hmm. And this is, was it like when I did the, um, 
the workshop at Rebel Wisdom when I was in the, the men, your men's group in, in London, which was brilliant. It's not just about the mind, it's about the heart, mm-hmm. right? You want to speak from the heart just as, as you're speaking from the mind. Um, and if you can do that, then people will hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think in the second interview I did with, with him, I did ask him, I did push him a little bit on, on that, like his reactivity towards the sort of social justice warriors or, um, and this, this sense of also, because he argues himself that um, I, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. So if that's the case, why, why the aggression towards the people? Uh, can we have that compassion towards people uh, despite the fact disagreeing with their actions and despite the fact that we may disagree with their, their thoughts and their beliefs. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I mean, I'd agree with that. I feel something I think I have said before, I would like to put out another, another film about the looking back on those two years of the sort of the, the, the Jordan Peterson phenomenon, which we all hope is, is not complete. Um, but sort of just looking on that at that trajectory, some of the the people who criticised him, and and I'd love to do it with an interview with with him. I don't know whether that's possible or or not, but I've I felt I have had some criticisms and some uh, concerns, and I, I felt that it would be in some sense I think disloyal. Or unfair to do to put out those criticisms without putting them to him personally. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. we have put out some films on on Rebel Wisdom that have been critical, and and I, I made sure I sent them to him personally. I sent them to him and Tammy. Like this is a few, this is a couple of years ago now, but but I felt like I, I wanted to do that in a really. Um, yeah, a, a really upfront way, and he responded well to those. Like they, they, they responded well to those, and took it in the in the spirit to which it was intended, uh, as far as I know. So, yeah, and, yeah. And the Peterson, you know, situation is another thing that is so hard to speak with nuance. Just like I was, just the conspiracy theory stuff. You know, it's <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't type thing. Yeah, I'm glad we did this. I felt like it was the the right format to start articulating some of this stuff because it's quite hard. It's really hard as well to, when you're articulating something difficult for the first time yourself, it's, you come up against like the broadcaster in me and the the kind of perfectionist in me wants it to be perfect. and it's very difficult for it to be perfect when you're kind of still in the process of thinking about what it is you actually think and how it needs to be framed. So, yeah, I feel, I feel like just but in the process of articulating, a lot of it kind of lands and, and you, you learn what you think while you're speaking a lot of the time. So this is, this is another part of this, of this question that you asked before about what is, what is the nature, like the nature of this enterprise has to be real time sense making and articulation of things that may not have been fully you certainly i mean other people probably have expressed it far better than than I can and have in this conversation, but we all need to be at the edge of our thinking and at the edge of our articulation where we're actually trying to find the words for it as we're we're talking that's that's the nature of the I'm I'm really clear that that is the nature of the exploration that we all need to go on is to bring ourselves to that edge because the the systemic crisis that we are at the beginning of is going to be like I think we're all perceiving all of us in this space are perceiving that it's this is it this is the this is the hopefully the phase shift but potentially something more catastrophic. And the only way, none of us know what the, uh, what the world on the other side of it looks like. The only way to get there is by 
articulating in real time and trying to trying to yeah trying to tune into what wants to emerge through us yeah yeah totally and i feel like i'm sort of in it now like when i was just observing the culture war the nomadic tribes but i actually want to get tribal now i want to be like i want to find my tribe the embodied tribe in the, in the purest sense i want to find communitas because i think that's where, where beauty is and that's where and you have to be truthful in order to get there um and then before we go that i just wanted to like just say something about but you, um, it's almost like uh, that kind of like what you said about your perfectionist desire and, and then, you know, like the, the pressure that you put on yourself to produce really, really good content. It, it puts you in a position of the sense making web, like Rebel Wisdom, in a lot of people's eyes are the gold standard. Um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there um, and we're, we're, we know all the players in this space. And we're friends with them. But you guys, you know, you put yourself in a situation where you have most eyes on you in a way. And it's almost like, you know, the, the cliche line, like with, uh, you know, great power comes great responsibility. And it's like, now you're in, a, you're in a situation, this liminal war, where you're almost sacrificing that sort of that, that perfectionist tendency in front of others. So it's like an act of sacrifice. So it's like its own hero's journey that, that you're on here, which, which I find quite delicious, if true. Well, who knows? I mean, the danger of all of this is, is, inflation and not being held accountable and and all of these things like i mean i do feel that like i certainly in myself feel that sense of real okay this is this is what we've been building up to we've all had this sort of sense of this was coming whatever this was this was coming we didn't know it was going to be a pandemic but the but this sort of the system was was on overload, and this something like this was going to happen, and so yeah, I feel that sense of alignment, that sense of like real urgency, and that sense of um, kind of, and we all need to find that. If like is is like if not us, who? Right. Really. Okay. What, yes. While while also being aware that there's the risk of inflation and the risk of. Um, bullshitting ourselves and the risk of like all of those things come in as well well let's take brian rose as an example like that to me is like perfect example it's inflation it's getting caught up in some kind of archetypal struggle of only seeing sort of one side of of, of the coin and i think it's a it's a we see it he's not the only one like we see it a lot it's like that for me is a really tra it's a tragic trajectory it's identifying oneself with one side of an archetype it's 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 allowing the inflation it's kind of the manic energy of the moment and being overwhelmed by the manic energy of the moment and then the ego grasping onto this rather than allowing it to pass through and thinking that we like this messianic fervor that comes in as well um uh, we talked to like psych psychedelic narcissism all these sort of things it's like being aware that that's that's a part of the the territory as well and like, I think if you have this, if your primary relationship with others is asymmetrical via broadcast media, um, then I think you can get captured by ego very easily. Um, but I think with, uh, with us, like, uh, we talked about ego before being captured by ego and we might have different conceptions of ego, but I think you can get in right relationship with ego in such a way that you are still ambitious enough to make uh, a difference in the world, but you don't identify it with it completely in order uh, to be kept in check. And it, the trust comes to mind. Like, do we trust our people, our tribe, our audience to keep each other, to keep us in check? Like, I trust you to call me out on my bullshit and you have, and I think you trust me to call you on your bullshit, which I have, right? So we trust each other there. And um, we're not submitting each other to each other because you know we wanna be nice or likable or whatnot. And I think that's what's needed. And not only modeled sort of this uh, transparency and truthfulness with ourselves, uh, but also in dialogos, in dialogue together. Yeah. Yeah, this is a whole new, I know you have to go, so this is a whole new topic. But, <laughs> but all I'll say on that is like, I don't think people realize just how, how important that is and how much it's required. Like, the... <sighs> 
we all, like the amount of work, the more that I've got into sort of personal growth work and accountability and all of that, the more I've realized like that never ends, like in any, yeah. in, in, in any good relationship. And I think that's what we need within the sort of, I don't think we've got anywhere near enough of it in the, in the web of people that we're talking about. I think there's way, there's way too much um, proxying of, of authority to some key nodes. There's way too much uh, lack of kind of accountability and, and willingness to kind of test our ideas and test our own bullshit against each other. There's not enough communication. There's too many people who are who just don't have any concept of what this kind of path of growth and a growth looks like and back away from from anything that feels like it challenges their their personality or their ego structure it's like no you've got to you've got to fucking steer into it you've got to go into the fire and i think it's only those of us who've done quite a lot of that inner work that realize just how difficult that is and how much how much we need to to steer into that yeah that's all that's all i'll say because that could be a whole nother topic yeah. And I'll end with this, that um, now that it seems like we're patting each other on our, our backs, <laughs> feel free to call us on our bullshit, uh, whoever's listening right now, uh, yeah. we can take it. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, man. That, that was fun. Yeah. It's always a pleasure, man. And um, yeah, keep on doing, give a shout out to the stoa that you've been running and putting yeah. your heart and soul into since the beginning of this. So you're you're creating a place for people to come together and do all of this work. So it's really great to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah you just go to the www.thestoa.ca. You can check it, read about it there. Cool, man. Cool. We'll catch up soon. Cool. Be well. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.